right, guys. Hello, hello, everyone. This is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, and we are continuing with Carlson's Endgame Growth Part 2, where we have made some progress last time, and we're moving along, and I want to share with you some of his amazing Endgame uh, technique from the World Blitz Championship, which he won recently. So... We are going to be going through the same format. I will be showing you instructive games, asking you critical questions, and try to have you guess the right move, ideally um, for the side that you move. But you know, general ideas like plants and uh, who is better in terms of eval and such. All right, so let's give a chance for some more people to join. And can you guys see and hear me okay? Let me know in the chat. Everything is working fine. Yes, okay, perfect. All right, so right off the bat, who knows um, if you guys follow the World Blitz Championship, something special about this game, uh, Kovalev against Carlson. Anybody knows the history of this game? There's a funny, funny little preface before the game even begins. Anybody remembers? That's right, Joshua. Yeah, Dean Carlson arrived. He arrived quite late. This is a three plus two. And Carlson was late, I don't remember, two or two and a half minutes. Uh, yeah, two and a half minutes. That's right, Eric. This is amazing that he still got to play Kovalev, who is over 2,600 classical rating, and uh, crush him easily. Of course, in an equal endgame, as we've seen him do uh, time and time again. So here we have a position in front of you. If you guys uh, already know what Carlson played, uh, good for you. But if you don't, try to guess what is Black's next move. This next move is very important to keep putting pressure on Wyatt's position. So obviously, we have a symmetrical structure. The benefit that black has is the bishop pair and the half open a file. So what did Magnus do here? Yep. Some people are already answering this one. Okay, good job. Anybody else? Yeah, a lot of you are getting this one. Okay, let's give people a chance. So I think everyone, actually everyone is getting this one correct. He did play the move rook a4, which is a very cool idea. Not only are you attacking the deep one, you're also stopping white's major threat, which was bishop to b4. If you allow bishop to b4, let's say you mindlessly play this move king f7. Basically, you know, generally you want to get the king closer to the end gate to the center in the end game. After bishop here, if you take take there's no way you're going to win this position. It's not so easy, guys, anymore. So let's go back and try to anticipate what happened next. So pawn is under attack. Bishop c3 is more or less autopilot play. Again, remember the situation on the clock. Magnus arrived late. By now, I think they're getting really close. They're getting probably closer on the clock. Uh, Magnus played extremely fast. So what will you play here as black? Yeah, Adi says time equalizes around here. So why don't you guys take a moment and try to guess how is Magnus improving this position? Obviously, black's a bit better, but so far, white's two weaknesses are protected, right? So you need some kind of a plan to try to improve your position. All right, people are suggesting really good moves here. What are some of the ideas? Bishop f5 suggested by some people hitting the knight. b5 with idea b4, interesting idea. Getting the king closer to the center. Let's see who is right. Magnus plays bishop f5. This is a direct attack on the knight. Out of all of these options, this is the most flexible. Meaning that 
for example, b5 is not as flexible because you give the knight c5 square. King f7 is not is actually quite flexible, but it doesn't attack anything, and it gives white lots of time. So maybe white will play like a3, knight b4, whereas this is direct attack on the knight. So knight is under attack, indeed. Knight e1 is already a mistake, believe it or not, guys. Knight e1 is a mistake. Uh, what white should have played is inserted this very cool intermezzo move b3. And this move is the only way to keep equality. In blitz, it's very easy to miss intermezzo moves because you have seconds sometimes to make decisions. Knights are under attack. You move the knight out of the way, and then you want to maybe try to reroute the knight. C2 is unavailable. Maybe knight, knight f3, but even there, it's not obvious where the knight's going. So, yep, b3 was the only way to do this. Knight e1 is a mistake. All right, so now Magnus has <clears throat> nice control of the position. He plays king f7. Notice that now this is one of those situations where you have plenty of time as black. So if you have plenty of time after king f7, what are you, your next few moves will be? Let's see how many of you are natural endgame players. What is your typical black uh, improvement? Yep, slow improving. Um, king going to e6, maybe, but then what? What's your general idea? Okay, good job. Yeah, I see some people are making the right idea. Uh, ideas work here. So one idea is to try to get the b pawn rolling to b4. But this idea of king side expansion is not totally out of the question. You never know when limiting this king's scope is going to come and help. This is a classic king side expansion as well. So just improve your pawns, your pieces, and try to make white run out of useful moves. So Magnus uh, faced this move a3, which now frees this rook. And he plays b5, OK? Why is this a good move? You never know when b4 can come in handy. Also, the rook may, may go to c4, and the pawn may protect against some trades. So this is a useful move. OK, rook c1. Black is thinking about either activating the rook on the c file, but it's not that easy with the bishop on c3, or perhaps knight c2, knight b4, knight e3. OK, so far so good. Still not easy for Magnus to break through. Let's keep going. Rook c4. Anticipating the c file opening up and completely paralyzing white on the spot. Notice that moves like b3 will almost backfire because a3 is too weak. All right, so uh, again, this is a blitz game, so you got to you know, keep in mind, people, these guys are playing pretty fast. Rook d1 is played. He's like, uh, I'm not sure what the rook is doing there. Maybe there's b4. And also the big question is bishop takes a3. What is going on, guys? Is he allowing this bishop takes a3 or what? So why don't you guys think what you're going to play next as Magnus? Okay, some people saying, I don't like bishop a3 because rook a1 would counterplay. Perhaps, yeah, rook a1 is some counterplay, but it does require some calculation. For example, bishop d6, rook a7, I can drop back to um, c7 and maybe threaten b4 and, you know, try to win the game on the c5. Uh, there's also, yeah, as correctly, somebody mentioned that bishop a3, rook a1, b4 right away. So things are not so easy. But let's see if what Magnus does here. He plays b4. Oopsies. After all, Magnus is human, guys. He is missing the basic tactic, but he's going for the positional idea, trying to trade all his weak pawn. Uh, Bishop a3 was the right move, as you guys pointed out there in the chat. So this is definitely advantage to black. I'm not sure why Magnus missed it. It's not like he had seconds on the clock. I think he still had time, but okay, these guys are playing really fast. 
and Magnus just plays b4. So, but he is human, okay? We know that he makes occasional mistakes. Okay, 24 seconds. Okay, 24 seconds, uh, that's not a lot of time. So pawn takes b4, bishop takes b4, and then bishop takes b4. So notice one thing, it's an improvement for white because he got rid of the bishop pair. What is the drawback, guys? The drawback is the rook is overloaded. You got the rook protecting two pawns. All right, new position for us. What is black's plan? What are we going to do here? Not easy at all to win the game. Not easy. Max is going to make it make an attempt to put pressure. So why don't you think for a moment? What is black's plan? And how should Black improve his position? Okay, I see some good answers. The queen side expansion that we discussed earlier with potential g5, h5, h4. Maybe bring the king to the to the side of the board, c4, b3. Notice this king is a little bit further away as well. So yeah, I like all of these suggestions. Now Magnus plays g5 okay good job everyone who said queen side expansion even queen side expansion many moves ago this is autopilot move for magnus he understands the benefit of these pawns can somebody explain to me why uh advancing these pawns queen side i mean sorry king side expansion why is king side expansion useful in these end games because there are no threats this king is totally safe why is g5 h5 useful plan Can you explain? Okay, Angela says fix white pawns. Limit the pawns and the king to Zugzwang. Pawn endgame. Yeah, all of these are very good. Yeah, so by gaining space, you provoke weaknesses. The ultimate weakness is this pawn on h3 and this pawn on g3. This pawn on h3, right? They carry the h pawn is very classic in a lot of openings. It's not so much as to checkmate the king, although the back rank is weak. It's fixing the pawn on h2 and making sure that white's going to have problems. Also, you are restricting the e1 knight, so good job, Austin, too. So, of course, white now tries to solve that problem. He plays f3. So what is his idea? Perhaps to activate the king. He wants to get the king to e3. Maybe he wants to get the knight going later. So Magnus plays h5. As anticipated for him, this is piece of cake, this kind of expansion. All right, white plays king f2, and Magnus plays h4. All right, good job, everyone who predicted king side expansion. But now, g3, big dilemma. Do we take, do we play h3, or do we do nothing? Right, this is typical blitz autopilot decision. You barely have any time to think. How would you approach this one? So what is autopilot move? Is there an autopilot move? King g6. Yeah, there's a, some people are noticing problem with h3. Yeah, first of all, good job everyone who immediately spotted h3, g4, king g3. This board on h3 is going to be doomed. And it's not a great idea to allow this. So concretely, h3 doesn't work. So it's basically either do nothing or to take. And Magnus says, I take. Now, I'm not necessarily uh, against taking, but I also think that just simply playing moves like king e6 are not bad. Because if you think about this, board on h4, is this a weakness? Or a strength. I would probably argue that it could be a strength because after knight here, h3, knight check, I don't really think he can win that pawn easily. Although Magnus is definitely worried about moves like this. Of course, then we're going to try to paralyze them with this move. Still, 
game was very close to a draw. So probably Magnus was worried about this pawn getting weak. He took. Okay, not a mistake. Pawn takes, but king e6. So what are we noticing? We're noticing less and less material on the board. White managed to trade the bishops. White managed to trade a pair of pawns. He's not lost quite yet. But remember, it's a blitz game. Sooner or later, he's going to have to make some moves that are passive, in the passive position. So he plays knight g2, e3. Good move, as pointed out to Austin. Magnus correctly plays king d6. Knight here and gets the bishop as <laughs> out of danger as he can to e6. Here's a question, though. Why not g6? Can somebody answer this question? It seems like bishop controls the c2 square and more diagonal. Why was Magnus worried about this position? Was he worried about this f4, f5 push, or knight g4? What do you think, guys, in the chat? Well, on e6, it also protects f5, right? Ah, some people are still not sure. I am almost certain that he was worried about knight g4. I don't think Magnus would be really worried about f4. This is a big strategic concession. You are given this bishop this beautiful e4 outpost. And now white is almost like in paralysis mode. If this rook can even swing to b3 or eventually get redirected to like a1, h2, the g3 pawn could actually be quite weak. This bishop is a monster. Yeah, so like a Swiss cheese, Joshua correctly points out in the chat. So yeah, I think Magnus was uh, more worried about the knight g4. So thus, bishop here. Okay, king e2. White's getting closer. Rook b3. No way, my friend. You're not getting closer. I am paralyzing you the third rank. And again, this is where a lot of people will start to make mistakes because white doesn't have an easy move. Perhaps rook c2 to get to the c file. But it's not obvious how to like hold this fortress. You have to be patient. And white just waits, king f2. I think being patient is the right approach. He basically tells Magnus, well, I don't really have a way to improve my position further. I'm just going to wait and see what you do next. Yeah, he's trying to move fast. That's right. Rook b4, Magnus is also playing a little bit of waiting game because he wants to gain some clock time of the clock. It's three plus two. I've, yes, objectively, the game is equal. Practically, uh, both players have seconds left. Who has easier moves? I would say probably black has easier moves. Black has more active rook, but it's not easy to make progress. Okay, yeah, more chances. That's right. So king e2. There we go. Rook a4. Remember we talked about redirecting the rook, maybe rook a1 with rook h1 ideas. Then there is this g3 pawn. If it goes to g4, f3 could become weak. Okay, white says, I'm just going to play king f2. <laughs> I'm not worried about anything. Uh, I also point out that king d3 is equal here. So king d3 is not a bad move. Why? Because now the king protects the pawn and this rook on d2 is a little bit more free to move around. But okay, why thinks he's got this fortress? Why change things? Bishop d7. That's why the king is on d6. The bishop is now free to roam around. g4. There we go. White made a, makes a commit, committal decision. He puts the pawns on the light squares. Although I would argue that it's really hard to get to this pawn. Uh, the king is sort of, has a lot of range between these, these three squares. Rook a1, making progress, right guys? Not clear what black wants to do. Maybe Magnus wants to push the b pawn to like b4, b3. And maybe some rook c1 ideas. Not easy again to break through, but he's making the... He's making something out of nothing. So rook d1. Okay, big question, guys. Trade rooks, yes or no? Quick, split second decision. Yes, no, yes, no. All right. I like the answers in the chat. Absolutely not. 
<laughs> just kidding. That's right. Yeah, because guys, your best piece is your rook. The moment you trade, there is no way you're going to break through. Right? Like, I don't even see how. You can, this knight can go to c3, king can go to e3. These two pawns and these this pawns, everything is protected. This is like a dead draw. Yeah, you want to keep at least some pressure, and Magnus knows how to put the, how to keep the pressure. It's already moved 39. Again, these guys have seconds, but remember, it's 3 plus 2. By playing really fast, you, get, you gain some seconds on the clock. Rook d2, though, he's saying, no way, my friend. I've got this fortress. How are you going to break it? And b5. Remember, guys, Magnus will squeeze water out of stone. You give him a chance to push the b-pawn. It's Again, it's unclear, like, how is the b-pawn going to help him win the game? But Magnus is really good at these types of position. He improves every single piece, the king, the rook, the bishop, the pawn, to its maximum. Eventually, white may make a mistake. That's what his idea is. Is right, he's trying to put pressure. King e2, of course, b4. You never want, know when this b pawn can come in handy. You have this check, it could join the party going to b3. Still, no winning threat. There's no winning threat. Position should be able to uh, hold, right? King d3, though, king is going for a little walk. All right, is this losing or no? Okay, it seems like this is game over after bishop b5, but nope, king can sneak to c2. So white is still holding on. So bishop b5 check is played, king c2. Yep, somehow he's still holding on. Bishop c4. All right, big question, guys. Autopilot move, do you take or not? Quick, quick decision. Take or not take? Take or not take? I sure hope everyone answers no. This is very, very dangerous endgame. The king can go to d5. These two pawns paralyze the king. Rook a1, I'm going to go around. Very, very dangerous. White may lose this one, guys. You don't want to allow this. Of course, there's also c3 ideas. Yeah, this is very dangerous. So good job. Everyone's got this one, right? Absolutely not. So he played the uh, king b1. I also point out, Rook h2 activating the rook is a very classic way to play for activity and make a draw with idea rook h6, right? Or rook h7, knight f5 type of stuff. This is not a bad move. Uh, rook d1, stopping this rook from going to a1 is not a bad move either. Uh, but in the game, king b1 is played. Can't really blame white for playing king b1. It's so, so logical to stop rook a1 as well. Also, knight takes c4 is a big uh, tactical threat. And Magnus quickly redirects the rook. Notice how the king made the journey from this side of the board to this side of the board. And Magnus realizes that he's got potential to tar tar target this f3 pawn. Uh, maybe even like rook e8 in some way. So white plays king c2 back, realizes that the king is sort of useless there. Magnus redirects the rook again inviting white to make this mistake but white player is a strong grandmaster he plays oh he did make a mistake oops <laughs> i was gonna say he didn't make this mistake but yes he did uh why did he make this mistake i can tell you his thought process guys he basically thought that after knight f5 um he didn't see how to make progress he thought black is simply gonna play king here and this king is kind of like in the semi made in that rooks coming in the king's coming in pawns coming in he just didn't know what to do and he just decided you know what rook and pawn end games generally are drawish i'm just gonna take and hope for the best okay can't blame him also he was worried i'll tell you what he was worried about as well the other worry is this bishop e2 and this f3 pawn is doomed quite legitimate worry right so these two worries are probably what caused him to do it. Maybe king d1, stop that. Maybe I'll play b3. Maybe now rook, rook in the feet. It's not that easy to make progress for black. Oh, you're right. This is easily winning. Maybe that's exactly what he saw. Yeah, 
this is a good point. You can't you can't do this. Bishop b3 and rookie one. Yep. Um, so maybe there's another way to protect e3 uh, e2 square, maybe knight g3. Although you have to be worried about this move, I would say. Not pretty. Very, very tough. So I can't really blame him for taking this. Can't blame him at all. All right, here we go, guys. Magnus is in his element. D5, what are you going to do? You have a promise in uh, Rook and Pony Endgame. White is basically putting all his money on the D pawn. So what are you going to do? Play Rook E3 or Rook E5 or what else? Yeah, some people, well, rook, what, Rook D8, somebody said? What? Rook E3, okay. A lot of people send Rook E3. And of course, Magnus plays Rook E3. Very logical move. But hold on, I play rook d4. It is annoying, as Austin says. After rook e3, rook, this is also annoying. You had to foresee this resource. Magnus inserts this intermezzo check. King there. And simply takes the pawn. White says, hold on a second. I can take your pawn. And Magnus says, and so can I. And at the end of the day, <laughs> Black is up a pawn in the Rook and Pawn endgame. And what do you think, guys? Is this a win? A draw? What's going on? Wesley says drawish. A lot of people say it's a win. So what is your winning plan if you say it's a win? Yeah, you want to get Austin points this out. You want to get two versus one passers. Right, you know what that what that means, guys. Two versus one passers. If you lose the B pawn and win the G pawn, these two passers with the king are gonna win you the game. It's a classic case, two versus one. So how does Magnus do that? King C5. Okay, rook stays. Rook F4. Now, do you really want to enter the king and pawn end game? You probably don't. All right, so he has to go this way. An interesting decision now. A lot of you, I'm almost certain most of you will take this pawn and in a blitz game, that is. Like in a classical game, maybe not. But a lot of people are tempted to go for this. Rook f6. But the problem is where your two passers. Two connected passers, that is. So king d4, exclam. Uh, probably king d5 does the job as well. So if you said king d5, you also get credit. King d4. Rook check, king e5. And after this, it's exactly what we wanted. It's game over. Rook takes g4. All right. This is piece of cake. Most of you should be able to win this with your eyes closed, probably. Right? What is the winning plan? We get two versus one, two connected passers. Well, trade rooks, uh, I don't know if that's a plan because they're not going to allow you the rook trade. Yeah, the plan is simple. You want to push the pawns, support them with the king, and use the rook to put your rook behind the enemy pawn, like on b1, or if the pawn is like all the way here and this rook is in front of it, the rook wants to be behind the pawn. So how do we do this? Well, first, check. The king cannot go up, right? You cut the king off, and then you push the pawns. Because once the pawn gets to b4, then you put the rook behind it. So for now, just keep pushing. Don't use your king. You don't need the king to come here. The rook does the job on b2. Use the king to support the pawns. Yeah, Magnus, textbook example, right? King this direction, pawns are winning. This guy is no, is not going anywhere. So, And I don't remember if white flagged or resigned, but this is elementary win. Uh, the king in front of the two pawns, just simply pushes the pawns and white resigns. All right, so what did we learn from this game? That if you are a world champion, your name is Magnus. First of all, you can be late two and a half minutes to the game. <laughs> then calmly adjust your pieces and get a nice advantage. Well, not advantage, but let's say practical edge out of the opening. Mess up, blunder. You know, he missed bishop takes a3, winning the pawn. But yet his technique was so good he kept putting pressure, pressure, pressure black. I mean, white was defending really well for a while. And then eventually he cracked and 
lost the game. And this is how 99% of Magnus's endgame wins are. The position could be equal, and at some point his opponents crack. Let's keep going. Good job, guys, on this one. Uh, I'm going to give you another example. This is as drawish as it gets. Magnus is black against Shimanov. This is round 20th. Uh, so this is what, two rounds before uh, before he became the world champion or even one round before? So this is like toward the end of the tournament. Well, how many of you, first of all, will agree to a draw here as black? Let's say your, your opponent just made the move and offered you a draw. How many would uh, agree to a draw? Ah, depends on the opponent's rating. Me against the GM. Okay, let's say white as a GM. White as a GM, a GM just offers you a draw here. Anybody will agree to a draw against a GM as, as black here? <laughs> Shake hands, then run. Me? Okay, so you see, guys, it's interesting that your decision is impacted by your opponent. Uh, Magnus is playing the GM, yet for him, draw is not an option. Interesting thought process, right, guys? The thought process of a world champion is you play for a win even if the position is equal as it is here, right? So it's a mentality. Right to become a world champion, you need to have a world championship mentality. Basically, that even the position equal you play on, you create chances. So what happens here? C five. How many of you would consider the move C five? Aren't we taught? Wait a second. That gives you IQP. D C five, Bishop C five, Knight E five. Look at this. IQP is not bad. Aren't we taught IQPs are bad? What did Mike Magnus do? Is he trying to lose this game? Anybody? Why? Can somebody explain that to me? So d4 will come one day. I'm not sure if I understand that logic. Does it make sense? IQP is double-edged. Okay. So what you're trying to say is that you change the pawn structure to uh, get some asymmetry going to try to play for a win. Okay, I like that. But the idea is now, it's not easy for white to occupy d4 square because you can always allow a bishop takes d4. So think about this guy. IQPs are almost always bad if the knight on d4 or somebody else is easily protected and you can't easily take it. Okay, so it's imbalance, but it's the kind of imbalance that's hard for white to get the knight there. And also notice the range of this bishop. Not that f2 is a weakness, but necessarily, right? But still, some annoyance. All right, knight e5 is played. Okay, logical move. Trying to put pressure on the queen. Queen c7, attacking the knight. Knight back to f3 with a silent draw offer. <laughs> silent meaning that he's waiting for Magnus to go here and white's going to play knight e5. We already know that Magnus doesn't want to draw, so Magnus just takes. Okay, how could a grandmaster ever lose this position? Queen protects the pawn. F2 is well protected. Not a single weakness. Opposite bishops definitely make it more drawish. Just because he is playing Magnus, right? It doesn't mean that Magnus is some magical creature that always wins at any position. Although maybe he is. <laughs> but the problem, I think, is psychology. The psychology is that when you're playing for a draw as white, you may play some you may make some passive decisions and those passive decisions add up and eventually you may be under some pressure i think that's the problem here white is at risk of being lulled sort of to sleep to think that oh he can just make a draw easily 
not necessarily that white needs to play for a win to make a draw, but basically the mentality is you play chess, right? You don't play for a result. I think that's the right mentality is you play chess. If black makes a mistake, you punish black. And if black doesn't make any mistakes, white also should not make any obvious mistakes. Of course, it's easier said than done. Under pressure, you have no time. You're playing Magnus. You're always nervous, right? Just Magnus sitting in front of you will probably put the fear, <laughs> fear in your heart. So Magnus plays queen b6. Not a single threat, guys. Everything is well protected. All right, so white shouldn't panic. He plays knight g5. But, right, this is a move that he's like, I'm just playing the waiting game. If you play more aggressively with b4, bishop d6, you can actually play c4 next. And there is no way you can lose this one, right? You kind of change pair of pawns. And I don't really see you losing this one. Again, Magnus can do some magic, but this is fine. So again, but this is not the mindset of a player who is playing for a draw. B4 is way too active, followed by C4. He just wants to do nothing. He just plays knight G5. But hold on a second. Magnus now plays A5. Little by little, hinting that I'm improving my position. White says, what is this A5 business? I'm just going to play A4. Okay, logical move. Queen c6. Oh, maybe there is some pressure here. Maybe there is some discovery on the king. So something out, nothing, but white's firmly in control. Bishop b5 is a good move. Kicking the queen off, queen c7. And then bishop back to d3. Again, the mindset is drawish. If you guys are thinking about non drawish but trying to keep your mind, again, offensive, Offensive chess is to play this move, bishop e8. It's a target. And if knight takes, you can take with the queen. Right? I'm sure this move did not even occur to white. Right? That's the thing. He's only thinking about playing for a draw. So he plays bishop back to d3. So this mentality to not think about offensive moves at all may cause a problem later on, as you will see shortly. h4. Excellent move and excellent practical decision. Fixing the pawns, and now white is again not sure what to do. Uh, queen e6. I guess queen e6 you can consider, but I don't really know what your idea is. If I just ignore this queen, I'm not going to take it, of course. So g4 is played. Logical move again, right? He doesn't want to ruin his structure. So he plays g4. And Magnus plays queen f4. You already sense that the position is becoming very critical. Now, and this is sort of Magnus's philosophy. I don't know if you uh, read his interview or heard his interview. He says, initially, the position is drawish. My opponent has maybe six to eight moves to maintain equality. Later, he will have four to six moves to maintain equality, then two to four moves to maintain, then two moves, then you have to make a choice. One move only to make a draw and the other one is losing. So what Magnus is doing, he's narrowing, narrowing down his opponent's options to the point where at some point, Shamanov will have to find only move to make a draw. Okay, so let's keep going. Knight f3, you guys are correct. This is a good defensive idea. But queen takes pawn. Again, asymmetry. He takes the h pawn, though. Right? It seems like white gained something from this asymmetry. It's not like a5, b7 are going to bother these pawns, whereas it seems like white's got three against two here. I don't know. What do you think about this asymmetry? Is this good for white, good for black? Unsure. Okay, Angela thinks it's good for black. Anybody else? It's only good for black if you can make this A pawn count, right, guys? If you can make A pawn count later on. Uh, that's a big hint already. At some point, Magnus will make this pawn count. Whereas this H3, G4, F2, not really movable just yet. 
Uh, yes, objectively, black is not winning, uh, not even better, probably. But of course, we're talking about practical chess, right? All of this is about practical chess. So queen back to f4. I already gave an eval here. Black is slightly better. Some may disagree with me, but I do feel it's easier to be black. Black has more active pieces, the queen and the bishop. And this b2 pawn, at some point, if I trade the queens, would become weak. Okay, so knight of three. All right, what did Magnus do, guys? Can can you guys guess his next move? Okay, let's give people some more time. Okay, I see some pretty good guesses there in the chat. Good job, guys. Clearly, you've been paying attention. Remember, guys, practical problems, right? Practical problems. And knight e4 is a perfect move to create practical problems. F2 is under attack. And you don't really want to change the structure of bishop takes e4 unless you think it's a draw. So white says, all right, I've got to get rid of this knight. I mean, f2 is just too weak. And what do we decide? Do we want to trade queens or not? As black, that is. Meaning that do you take with the pawn or with the queen? Again, for Magnus, it's an easy decision. For you guys, it may not be so obvious. Let's give you a little bit more time. Um, interesting. People are kind of split, looks like. Okay, let's give you some more time. People are a little split. Some people are thinking about, no, I want to checkmate the king. Some people, yes, let's get to the b2 pawn. We have a split. Let's see what Magnus did. Who is correct? Queen takes. And believe it or not, that's not an accurate move. Much better was pawn takes e4. That's a split moment decision, not an easy call at all. We know what Magnus prefers. He prefers no counterplay. Without the queens, he is thinking about this b2 pawn. Of course, objectively, white should still be able to make a draw, but it's not so easy. Uh, this gives him very good winning chances, but position is extremely complex, and you're kind of putting your money on checkmate in this king as well. So both camp are correct. You can do d takes e, which is objectively a stronger move, but queen takes has very nice practical trap that white fell right for it. White says, I'm going to trade queens. Yay, make a draw. Big mistake. Well, maybe not big, but you don't want to do that. King f1 is the equalizer. Now it's not very e easy for black to make progress. Very difficult move, king f1, because this is a draw. Black can't really get to the b2 pawn. And if you can't get to the b2 pawn, you're not going to be able to have any winning chances. So perhaps Magnus should not take, but in that case, how are you going to win the game? It's not obvious to me. Maybe a4, trying to advance pawns, but not so easy. So Shimarov makes this mistake, and knight g5 thinking that, all right, I'm going to make a draw. But guess what, guys? e3, blunder. Now, this is the losing move, f6, e. His last chance is king f1. Very difficult move. I said very hard on blitz. Right? Because you're kind of allowing him to take on f2. But this is losing. Okay? Can you guys see why this is losing? So it takes. Knight's under attack. Knight f3. A4 x clam. Yes, not bishop c1. Then he's going to be able to put the pawns b3 and c4. Okay, and Shimanov saw that, and he thought, okay, what's the big deal? I'm just going to get my knight to d3. Right, he calculated knight here, bishop c1, knight d3, and it's a draw. But what kind of miscalculation did he make? That's a classic one. Classic miscalculation. Come on, quick, quick, guys. This is a well-known pattern. Known pattern. All right. 
one person already got this one. Okay, another person got this one. Yeah, Joshua is correct. Yeah, so this pattern is a must know. Uh, is anyone not familiar with this pattern, Bishop C1, Knight D3, with the winning move? What is the winning? This is an easy winning move. You see this in a lot of these puzzles. Yeah, for Magnus, of course, this is a piece of cake. Again, hard to blame Shimano from a distance missing this tactic, but of course it's Bishop B2 and resigns immediate resignation. And this is a classic case of the pawn being better than the knight. Ah, you saw a clip of, the, clip of this, Wesley says. Okay, good job. So again, what are the lessons from this game? We had a dead equal position, again, going all the way to the beginning. Let's go all the way to the beginning here. That equal position, right? As a starting point, as I said, a lot of you may agree to draw. Out of a sudden, all of a sudden, Magnus plays c5. Okay, no big deal. Some trades happen here. Rooks get traded. This, this. White has a mentality that I am just playing for a draw. He doesn't look for any active counterplay. And Magnus keeps creating chances out of nothing, right? Keeps squeezing that water out of stone. Queen c6, okay, maybe d4. No way. Queen c7. Look at that. White did not play bishop e8. White just kind of waits. Okay, and now h4. I think White underestimated his h4 push. And things are pretty hard now. This, this, this here, the asymmetry. Magnus comes back. And then I mentioned D takes C may even be a better move, but Queen E4 still retains practical winning chances. King F1 is an easy draw, hard move to find, however. And after this, he just miscalculated. Again, King F1 is only move to make a draw, very difficult for Blitz. And this is just the classic Bishop takes B2 sack that White cannot really stop. So yet again, another win, another equal end game. All right, let's keep going. One more example coming up. All right, now, guys, we have Fabiana Caruana, who is high rated. They're the world champion. Look at that, 2847. How is that even possible? Fabi is high rated in Magnus. I guess they're using blitz ratings. No, this is not USCF. This is uh, World Feed the Blitz champion. So they're using FIDE ratings. And this is Blitz ratings. This is not classical, right? Classical Magnus is number one. This is Blitz. Fabi is pretty good in Blitz for those who don't know, right? And this is very important game. Again, from the same tournament. Doesn't look kind of similar to all the previous examples we looked at. Some symmetry. Okay. Maybe like White's Rook is a little bit more active. This knight on the g6 versus this knight. Like, it doesn't seem like black can do anything at all to play for a win. How many of you would agree to a draw? Maybe 90% of you would agree to a draw if white offered you one. Right, guys? But it is Magnus, remember. And it's only black, I believe, that can play for a win. White is not better. This is the wrong impression. Fabi might have misevaluated this position. If anyone can play for a win, it's black. But why? Can somebody explain? Why? Even though objectively it's equal, but black is going to have the better chances. Yep, Eric correctly points out, we have a target. Rook can go here, and if c3, you can play b4. So it's actually black, you can say, is first to try to create attacking chances. And of course, Magnus plays rook c6 right away. As I said, black is only a tiny bit better, but not quite enough to win the game. Fabi plays c3. Magnus could play b4 right away. 
but he first plays f6. Magnus loves to activate bad pieces. You see what he's doing to his knight? This knight is now free to roam around. Whereas this guy is restricted. Cannot do that, cannot do this, cannot do that, cannot go there. All right, so white plays g3. Classic endgame move. You don't know what to do, play g3, king g2, right? Fabi is playing this quickly. Uh, question from Austin, knight h2, f1, e3. Yeah, maybe. But by the time you get to e3, you may allow counterplay with b4. And if bishops get traded, knight f4. So g3 at least will stop it. Because b4 is coming. You can't stop it. And of course, Magnus plays b4 as we're talking about it. All right. King g2. Okay. Notice that Fabi doesn't want to go into this end game. Why? By now, it's pretty clear why. This is a weakness. This is a weakness. That's why. So uh, let's go back. So King G2. <clears throat> now Magnus takes. Bishop takes. All right. We have this bishop protecting the pawn on B2. Doesn't this remind you a little bit of the game against Kovalev. So the idea now is we get rid of this defender. This is annoying bishop. It's blocking a rook. It's protecting this b-pawn. Bishop d6 first. Notice Magnus is not in a hurry to trade the bishops. First, he wants to improve his knight. He can get knight here and here. White says, okay, I'm going to improve my knight. Magnus is improving his knight. Knight f1. So you see, eventually, Fabi does try this knight e3 idea. So good job, Eric, for pointing that out. But bishop to uh, b4, not so easy for white. Rook c1, bishop takes, rook takes. Looks pretty drawish, guys. Oh, that was Austin. Yeah, OK, Austin, good job. Okay, this looks pretty drawish. I mean, symmetry here, right? The knights are coming here. This king is a little bit more active. Yet it is important to know whose side to move it is. And it's Magnus's turn, and he plays rook b3. Guess what white has to do? Passive defense. Now it's pretty obvious that only black is trying to squeeze the wind here. Not easy at all. So Magnus is proven. Knight e6. This is an easy move. Knight here. Okay. No problem. Rook b2 attacking the knight. Knight c4. Rook a2. The rook is quite active. It can put pressure here and can go there and put pressure here. The knight wants to come there, of course. Rook d1. Fabi takes the initiative. But actually, knight c5 stops this initiative. So that you cannot really do anything with this knight attacking the pawn and protecting d7. All right, so rook d2. All right, questions for everyone. Will you trade rooks against Fabi? You're black. Are you going to trade rooks against Fabi? Quick, quick, quick decision. Split second decision. Splits. All right, by now everyone is getting this one, right? Just because he's Fabi and he's rated 24, I mean 28, 47. Doesn't mean you have to trade rooks. Of course, we play rook a4. That's what Magnus does. And all of a sudden, white is left with this dilemma. How did I get to this position? I'm giving up the e4 pawn, right, guys? Well, he plays knight e3. Caruana, though, finds a way to fight on. You see, all the previous opponents of Magnus, the moment they were under pressure, they crumbled. But Fabi... He gives up the e-pawn. Well, he has to, but look how great he plays now as white. He makes Magnus's extra pawn look like not a big deal at all. And this is, again, a lot of people will just play defensive chess and lose, but Fabi plays good chess, active chess. Rook d7, x clan. All right, this is the lunch row where the rook cuts the king. Very powerful seventh rank and the knight is coming in to say hello 
right? Activity above all, guys. Activity above all. And then you remember that. So rook here, Magnus is putting some pressure. Fabi activates the king. Excellent. Yeah, please take on f2. I don't care. You can take that pawn because knight f5 is coming next. So again, activity above all. Completely different thought process than the previous opponents who were playing defensive chess. Okay, Magnus says, I take on that challenge, Fabi. I'm up two pawns, my friend. And Fabi says, so what? Activity above all, knight f5. By now, everybody realizes important thing that white is completely fine. The knight and the rook give him sufficient counterplay, even though you are two pawns down. All right, any questions about this position? This is a very important position to realize that you are totally fine as white. But it's Magnus, guys. It's Magnus. Magnus is always going to seek chances. So he plays. Knight takes h3. Uh-oh. That's pawn number three. Right? But that's okay. White is completely fine. He gets this g pawn. And he gets the c pawn. Exactly. Right? So it's only one pawn down. But the key is active knight, active rook. This pawn is weak. And this king could make a run for it. Or maybe in this direction. I don't know which direction. Isn't white better now? Well, not so not so hot. I mean, you're still a pawn down. So it's black's turn. So h5 is played. Right? The idea is you get out of this knight h6 and you stop king g4. King e3. Knight g5. Knight d6. Activity again. Rook c2. Knight f5 back. He's maintaining the stance. He says, I've got the stance, and you can't do much. The king can't come in. That's the only drawback. But he's still maintaining the stance. Knight e6, though. There we go. Rook c6. King here. Check. And now Magnus comes up with a totally brilliant idea. By pure accident, or he calculated this. I don't know how he saw it. He comes up with this brilliant move. King g6. Rook takes e6. And what did he do here, guys? He doesn't take the knight. That's right. He takes the pawn. Amazing chess. And what did he do after this move? What did he do after this move, guys? This is a difficult move. But Magnus shines through. The key, guys, I'm going to give you a hint, is to trap this knight. You want to protect the f pawn while also not allowing the knight to escape. Yep, a lot of you get in this one. Rook c8, what an amazing move. And Fabi has no time to think. He just collapses. He plays king e3. Uh, that's pretty much losing the move. No, there is a move that he is in the game, was g4. That's a difficult move because after rook f8, knight f5, hg, it's three pawns against knight. Okay, guys? This is what he should have gone. It's still a draw. But it's a big fight. It's a big fight. But yeah, I can't really blame him for missing this. He plays this, and after rook h8, he is losing the poor knight. <laughs> it's a game, game over. So yeah, just amazing resource that Magnus found at the very end. And Fabi just, he either flagged or resigned because he realized this knight is lost. It's game over. All right. So those are the very recent example from the world blitz championship that we just looked at in all of those three starting positions what was the eval equal right maybe not that equal maybe some would say it's closer to that equal than not but in every single one of these games magnus was creating 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 the first two guys what did they do they just defended passively and then crumbled caruana 
when he realized he is losing material, he went very active. And I like what he did, active knight, active rook. But even there, Magnus found some miracle to create something out of nothing and win. So these are absolutely gold games, like absolutely instructive games. And they were blitz games too, right? Like Magnus is playing pure, um, you know, just like uh, intuition. He doesn't have time to calculate like classical. And this is where you really see the talent of a player shine and blitz when they're just like trusting their intuition. All right. So this is the lessons you should take away from today is that there's no such thing for Magnus as a, you know, equal or drawish position. He tries to squeeze water from stone. He creates chances. He doesn't have the mentality, I am playing for a draw. He has a mentality, I'm playing chess, and I'm creating chances. I'm trying to create play for win. And then Fabi is the only one of all these players who defended very actively and accurately. And he should have drawn, but yet again, you saw it happen. Right? He missed this rook c8, rook h8 idea. So that's it. That's it for today. Thank you, guys. Definitely some instructive uh, examples to take away from today. Bye, everyone.